for every good work. And we need to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. And finally, we need to prove ourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. I'm going to change the order of how I've been doing things uh, just a slight bit here. Um, we all know that it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to enlighten us as to the meaning of what Scripture is teaching. And so I want to take just a moment if we need to confess any sin uh, in order to uh, reestablish our fellowship with the Lord so the Spirit can do His work in us. So let's take just a moment to pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to study your message to us that was delivered through your faithful servants. In this instance, the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy. And we just pray, Father, that we would study these, uh, this message closely. Help us, Holy Spirit, to understand the message that's delivered and allow us to let it take root in our hearts and our minds to guide us through our everyday living. Help us, Father, to be good and faithful servants. Help us to enthusiastically share the gospel with those who need to hear. May our lives line up with what the gospel and what your word teach. And help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the end. Good morning. We'll see you next week. Go ahead. So we're going we're gonna to wrap up our study in 2 Thessalonians this morning. So there's a chance. Now just a forewarning, if I, if I see that I'm getting a little bit behind and, and I'm going to speed up. So for most of you, you realize that I speak too quickly anyway. And so it'll be like turning your YouTube or whatever on two times the play speed. So just be prepared for that. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will duly ignore it. So, um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at verses 11 through 18 this morning. Uh, just a quick reminder that when we went through 1 Thessalonians, we saw that the main focus of Paul's writing was dealing with the rapture of the church. And now here in 2 Thessalonians, he is dealing with correcting the instruction uh, dealing with the day of the Lord. And so there are two different uh, topics going on here. One is the rapture, one's the day of the Lord. They're not the same. They're separated. And as a matter of fact, they're separated by s at least seven years. So anyway, so what we're seeing today is that this false teaching concerning the day of the Lord that had come in had its consequences. And false teaching always has negative consequence. All right? And in this instance, the consequence is going to be seen in the fact that because they thought they were already in the day of the Lord, they're being thrown off their game, they're being disturbed in their spirit, and some have gone to the point where they think, well, the Lord's going to come back, and so uh, we just have a short amount of time, so I'm not going to work any longer, and then that also has further negative consequence. So we see that the key passage of 2 Thessalonians was chapter 2 and verses 3 through 5 where he corrects the uh, mis, uh, misinformation. I hate that word. That's all I ever hear anymore on the news and everything. But anyway, the misinformation that they had received, he's correcting it there. And so we've seen the comfort that he provides in chapter 1. We've seen the correction in chapter 2. And now we're looking at this last little tail end of the call to action dealing with the orderly living, and then we're going to move into his conclusion, which is a prayer for peace. So in verses 6 through 15, he's dealing with the, this concept of living in a manner that is orderly as part of the Christian duty of representing the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. He, he had already in 1 Thessalonians mentioned this idea that everybody needed to be working uh, so as to provide for themselves. But apparently some of these people, when they heard this false teaching, decided to discard what Paul had taught in 1 Thessalonians and go on living in a manner uh, where they were, uh, to use um, a little bit of slang, they were mooching off other people. 
okay? So here's what we're going to see this morning. Uh, we've already looked at his command to avoid unruly believers in verse 6. Let's read this together and then we'll dig in. So in verse 6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship. We kept working night and day to, uh, so that we, would, uh, we might not burden any of you, not because we do not have the right to, to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you, that you might follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order, if anyone will not work, neither let him eat. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man and do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. And yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All right, so in verse 6, we see that Paul has, has already instructed them to avoid those people who are living an unruly lifestyle. And he says to, to stay away from them, or to keep aloof, as, as my old New American Standard says here, to keep aloof. It simply means to separate from them, okay? And so that's the first thing we see, but he doesn't define yet who these people are, which he's going to do in verse 11. So in verses 7 through 10, through 10 he's, he's basically telling them, here's our example. We did this so that we could be a model for you so that you would mimic, and that's the word, the, the Greek word there uh, is, is a word where we get mimic. Okay, so he says, we want you to mimic the way that we lived. And so while we were with you, we had the right as apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ to earn our living from you. In other words, you provide our food, you provide our living, uh, our, our money, and, and uh, maybe providing uh, a place of lodging and those types of things. Paul says, but we did not do that. Instead, we worked. We worked hard. Uh, and that hyperbolic statement, we worked night and day so that we would not be a burden to you. And so that's his example that he puts forth in verses 7 through 10. And he concludes that again with that saying. He says, we, when we were with you, we were teaching you this, that if someone refuses to work, then they should not eat. In other words, if there's someone in the congregation, okay, congregate, this is family living he's talking about here, the church family. If there's someone in the church family who is, refusing, who, who is refusing to work, capable of working, but refusing to do so, you're not to provide for that person's needs, all right? Now, I'm a firm believer that when it comes to meeting needs, we start with our church family first, okay? And then we can reach out to the community, but church family comes first. However, in this instance, Paul is making it very clear that when there is someone capable of supporting themselves but refusing to do so, then we do not meet those needs, okay? And so he says, if they're not going to work, then they're not going to eat. And so now we come to verses 11 and 12 where he appeals to the undisciplined. And I use that word appeal simply because there's another A, the alliteration there. So we have avoid, adopt, appeal, and application. But appeal is a pretty gentle word compared to what Paul is actually doing here. He's commanding them. He said, you do this. This is the right way to live. And so you better do this or you're going to be facing consequences. All right. So verses 11 and 12, again, he says, for we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. All right, so what do we have here? First of all, he's going to identify those who are undisciplined. And, and we need to pay close attention to this because he's, he's giving us a very narrow window here. It's not just 
whoever you see in the church that you don't like the way they dress or what music they listen to or anything like that. He's specifically honing in on these people who are living undisciplined lifestyles, and he defines it by those who are refusing to work and are meddling in other people's affairs. It's very clear, very easy to see here. These are the ones doing no work at all, and because of that, uh, they become busybodies. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, for all of his faults, had a great saying that he came up with that idle hands are the devil's playthings. And that's exactly what we see going on in the church in Thessalonica. There were those who wouldn't work, and because they were idle, uh, they had a lot of time on their hands. And if, if you've ever had a lot of time on your hands with nothing to do, you know how frustrating it can be. And so you want to get up and do something. Well, these people, because they're made in the image of God, which means that we were made to do labor, to work, okay? That, that's not a product of the fall. And I know we all wish it was. Uh, but we were made, created to do work. God is a creative God. Look at what he did in six days. He created everything that exists. And look what he does every day. He holds all things together. He keeps things moving uh, and uh, keeps them from flying into pieces uh, from what we see in uh, Colossians. And so God is a God of creativity, a God of work, and he created us to reflect that. And so we were created to be producers, to produce things. And when we don't fulfill that obligation... Uh, then bad things happen. And we can see it around our nation in, in big cities where people are living off of other people. You, you hear, and forgive me, but I'm going to do this. Uh, we have this government class coming up, okay? So I invite you all, please come. It's going to be very interesting. Um, if you were here on Wednesday nights, you know that I've been teaching through my sessions for the last few weeks. And so you can skip Thursday night and Friday, uh, Friday morning. Um, but anyway, our government has grown so much larger than the founding fathers had wanted it to be to the point that now we hear people living off of the government, right? You hear that people live off of the government and you know what? That's a lie. People don't live off the government. They live off of you and me. They live off the people who are working, producing, doing, doing what God has called mankind to do. And then we are taxed and that, those tax dollars go to all kinds of things that they shouldn't go to. And one of those being supporting people who will not work and rewarding people who will not work. You want to know why our African-American culture is in the state that it's in? It's because the government stepped in so that the father of the household was no longer re required you can go back, you can look at the history and you can see the damage that it's done to the black community because government is now daddy. And the more kids you have, the more money you get from daddy. You may, you may think that sounds bad. You may think that sounds like I'm a racist. Well, call me whatever you want to. I really don't care. I'm concerned with what the truth says, or what the truth is. And because the government has overstepped its boundaries in that area, we see it not only in the black culture, but where I grew up, there was, there was a lot of poor, poor families, white, black, Hispanic, who were going through the same thing. Father's gone from the household, and therefore the government steps in and begins to support, and things go downhill from there. Anyway, uh, sorry for the commercial break, but anyway, Paul says that if someone's not working, they shouldn't eat. Now, we can't expect the lost world to live like a Christian. However, uh, we can put incentives in place for people to work, and we don't do that. In the church, there is a way to do that, and he's going to outline that for us. So first of all, he identifies those who are undisciplined. They're the ones refusing to work and meddling in other people's affairs as a result. And then he gives them a command. He says, verse 12, now such persons we command and exhort to work. We command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. I like the way, if you give it a very extremely literal translation from the Greek, 
it says something like this, that with quietness working of their own bread they may eat. With quietness working. What is that telling us? With quietness working. They were causing an uproar in the church. They were causing things to go sideways because they weren't living the way they should live. They were, again, mooching off the other church members. And if you go back to 1 Thessalonians, it also sounds like they were mooching off of the lost world, those who might have a little extra money. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, you need to, to work so that you can uh, act accordingly towards those who are without the church, who are outside of the church, okay? So it's a bad testimony that he's talking about here within and without the church. And because they were refusing to work and they were mooching off other people, it was causing dissension, causing problems within the church. And so he says that you, first of all, go to work. It's the first thing he says. And he says that work should be in a fashion that does not cause a disturbance within the body. And in doing all of that, then he says, you will be able to provide for your own food. You'll be able to provide for yourselves and not be a burden on the rest of your brothers and sisters in Christ. All right? So that's the command and the exhortation. Now he has an application for those who are living in obedience in verses 13 through 15. He says, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man and do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. All right. So what is he telling us here? Well, first of all, he says, do not become discouraged. Okay. Have you ever become discouraged living, trying to live in the manner that God has called you to live? Okay, I see some of you being honest, and the rest of you are just refusing to answer the question, which is fine. About a year later, Paul's writing to the Galatian church, the church of Galatia. And if you recall, when we went through that book, we found that Paul has some very harsh words for the church because they had allowed, again, false teaching to come into the church by Judaizers who said, uh, faith in Christ is necessary, but so also is circumcision and following the law of Moses in order to be saved. And so Paul chastises them severely. But towards the end of his letter in chapter 6, about a year after his second letter to the Thessal Thessalonians, he says this, and let us not lose heart doing good. And actually it says doing the good. What is the good? The word good here is a Greek word that means moral, uh, 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 moral, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, good morals, living rightly, okay? So he says, don't grow weary living in the right manner, morally good in all that you do. Something he does in the, in the letter to the Galatian church, however, is a little bit different because he gives them a reason for this. Now, again, in verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians, he says, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. But in his letter to the church of Galatia, he adds this little tag to the end of it. Let us not lose heart in doing good, because in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. There's a blessing for trying to live in the manner that God has called you to live and doing so without getting tired of it growing weary by it. You see other people living this way or that way, and you think, man, if I could just live like that or whatever, and you get discouraged. But Paul says there is reward to be had for living in a manner that pleases God. And although we look around us and we might think, oh, it is so difficult, we have to keep in mind, once again, as Paul does so often, points our attention to the future. You know, um, studying hard in school results in you getting this job or that job. Uh, working hard in, in practice results in you winning the game, winning the trophy. Uh, lifting hard in the gym results in you uh, bench pressing uh, something heavy. So he points our attention to the goal, not to the process, but to the goal. 
Don't grow weary in doing what is right because in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. And the idea that goes along with that is the possibility of growing weary with the result that we just simply give up. Is it possible for a Christian to simply give up on the Christian life? Is it? Of course not. This perseverance of the saints. You'll never give up on the Christian life. It's not true, is it? It's preservation of the saints that even if I did give up on the Christian life, I'd still be saved. But Paul makes it very clear. Uh, Demas, I have turned over to uh, Satan uh, for the destruction of his body so that he may be saved because he's, Demas has left me he, having loved the world more than the Lord. And that's just one example. There are several examples that he gives. That's the one that I can recall off the top of my head. And so he encourages those who are living rightly not to lose heart, not to become discouraged living the way that they should. And then he says, make a note, verse 14, look what he says. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note. Literally, the, the Greek word means to mark something or to, to make a note, a written note. In this instance, it really just, it means to mark, recognize what that person is doing so that the result would be that you disassociate with him. In other words, you, you, you it's kind of like if someone were to come to church, okay, Let's imagine this building was, was almost full. All these empty pews were almost full. And someone were to come in and sit down next to, you, next to you that hasn't showered in three weeks. Are you imagining that? Because you're just staring at me. But you'd kind of want to move, wouldn't you? Probably because of the smell it's kind of the picture I get in my head when I hear what Paul's writing here. He, he's not saying kick him out of the church. He's just saying change pews because his life stinks. And so we, we take a note of that person who's refusing to live in obedience to Paul's instruction. Take note of the person and disassociate with him. Take, change pews from where he's sitting. And the purpose is to cause him shame. Ooh, we know that's a bad word nowadays. You don't want to shame anyone, right? Body shaming and all of this stuff that they talk about. We don't want to ever shame anybody. Well, our, our part of the problem is that, that our society has lost the ability to be shamed. And especially nowadays, if there were someone in the church who was living a, a lifestyle that we would need to dissociate from that person, what would the person do? Ah, oh, they'd get up, walk out the door, and go to the church down the street. But in this day, as a friend of mine reminds, this society to whom Paul was writing is a, um, is a society that focused on either living a shameful lifestyle or living a lifestyle that could be looked up to. I can't think of the word I'm searching for here, but... Uh, and so to, in that society, to dissociate from someone would shame them. And they didn't have the opportunity to just go from Cornerstone Bible Church to first so-and-so church down the street. Because there was no other church. This was it. And so the goal was to put the person to shame, not for the sake simply of putting him to shame, but that the person would, would recognize his rebellion, his sinfulness, and repent and be restored to fellowship. And so that's why Paul says in verse 15, yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So don't look at him. And this, these are two uh, imperatives that Paul gives here. Do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him. These are two commands that Paul is giving. So we don't look at that brother as, as an enemy to be destroyed, but a brother to be reestablished in fellowship or restored. So we don't treat him as an enemy. On the other hand, we counsel him to change his 
behavior. That word admonish, the Greek word literally means to counsel someone to avoid or cease a detrimental act. Okay? If you would, take, take your Bible and turn a couple pages over to 1 Thessalonians 5. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul is ending his letter here again, and he gives us a very similar statement. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. In other words, counsel the unruly to change his behavior. Encourage the faint-hearted, those who are, who are becoming, uh, who are headed towards weakness. We encourage them to help them be strong and then to help the weak. And then the all all-encompassing statement, be patient with all men. If there's anyone here who's, who's looking at a future in counseling or uh, uh, some sort of psychological field, this is a verse to focus on. Counseling comes in different forms. You don't approach each person with the same attitude or the same instruction. I see my idea of counseling used to be that when someone comes in and and uh, is living, uh, having problems, and they're doing things that cause themselves problems. Uh, my uh, idea of counseling was, stop it. That's pretty much it. But I've been taking some courses uh, from a good biblical counselor, and he uh, uh, pointed us to this verse. You admonish the unruly, the un- unruly person who's living a lifestyle that's detrimental to himself and others. You admonish them. You counsel them to stop it right? But then there are those who are faint-hearted. Something's happened in their life, and they're just, man, they're just beaten down. And you don't look at them and say, stop it. Pull yourself up by your bootstrap. No, that's not how it goes. You're, instead, you encourage the person. You become their cheerleader, and you try to prop them up, help them get back up on their feet. You grab their bootstraps and help them up. And then there are those who have simply been so beaten down by life that they're weak and they're, they're needing to be treated uh, with some triage, with some medical assistance uh, figuratively. And so you simply, you help them, you encourage them, you um, just simply do whatever it takes within reason to help that person become stronger. But with all of these, the unruly, the faint-hearted, the weak, in all situations, you are to be patient with them patient with them. So he calls on us not to treat them as enemies, uh, but to counsel these brethren uh, to change their bad behavior. All right. Uh, Turn to Matthew chapter 18, if you would. We need to go through this pretty quickly. In Matthew chapter 18, this uh, very uh, famous passage dealing with church discipline. So Jesus is speaking. He says, if your brother, verse 15, if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two or more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Better translation would be tell it to the congregation or the assembly. And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a taxpayer. Okay, that was a bad thing, right? And so what is the process that he lays out for us here? Well, first of all, we address the person privately. Okay, we do it behind closed doors and we try to admonish that person, counsel him to change behavior. Secondly, you approach the person with two or three witnesses if that first encounter does not bring about the desired change. Now here in step number three is where Paul comes in in the passage that we're looking at today. We distance ourselves from that person, but not a total shunning or putting out of the church. And then back to Matthew, we go before the whole church. And this is known church members. You don't do it. uh, It's a closed door church meeting, not with just any uh, Jack Frost that comes in off the street. You, you clear out visitors and you deal with just church members and you do it gently. But then finally, there's a total shunning. The person is put out of the congregation if they refuse to change their behavior. 
And so what Paul is focused on here is this one step that Jesus did not include in, that, uh, in Matthew, and it is to distance ourselves but not totally shun the person uh, before we take it before the entire church body. All right, so that's orderly living, verses 6 through 15. We avoid unruly believers. We adopt the apostles' example. We appeal to the undisciplined, and we uh, see an application given to us for those who are obedient. Now, what is Paul's purpose for this section of 2 Thessalonians? Well, there are four that I uh, can see. First of all, he wants to reaffirm previous instruction. In other words, what he had already taught them while he was there, and also what he had reiterated in his first letter. Secondly, was to tell them how to shame these offenders in order to produce repentance. Repentance restoration is the goal, not the shaming, not the putting out of the church. Restoration, uh, uh, church fellowship and unity is the goal. And that's that third step is that he was wanting to make sure to preserve peace and unity in the body of Christ. And finally, I believe he, he wanted all of this to result in the obedience of those who were living undisciplined lifestyles. That, that fourth point is pretty obvious. All right. Now, let's go to the concluding prayer here in verses 16 through 18. Paul writes, Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All right, so what do we have going on here? Well, first of all, he has this prayer for peace. And there are several things to notice about this. First of all, this peace comes from the Lord himself. Remember, he is the Lord of peace. He is characterized by peace. His character is peace. And therefore, as God, as the creator, peace originates and flows from him. So if anybody is ever, ever, ever going to experience true and lasting peace, it's only going to come through Jesus Christ himself. So the world, I remember Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Theological Cemetery, Cemetery. <laughs> That's called a Freudian slip. Seminary. In one of the teachings, I've heard him teach online uh, some old recordings, and one of the things that he would tell his students is don't preach against the world. And in, in his time, he was talking about drinking and things like that. Don't preach against those things. Because those are the only consolation that the lost world has. It's the only I'm trying to remember the word he used. Anesthetic, that's what he used. It's the only anesthetic that people, uh, lost people have to ease their pain uh, because that they are lost people. And the idea being, though, is that these lost people in the world, they, on the outside, they look like they're enjoying life and things like that. But you can hear in the statements of people like... Um, why is it that I forget people's names every time I start to use them? Famous actor dude who said, you know, I, I've gained the world. I, I've got riches. I, I've got all this. He said, and I'm still empty. Brad Pitt, thank you. Thank you for whoever sent that thought my way. Brad Pitt said something to that effect. He said, I've, I've got everything, you know, but there's still this emptiness. That's because that emptiness is that void. I think Billy Graham spoke about that, that, uh, uh, hole in the person's soul or heart that only God can fill. And he fills it because he sent his son Jesus Christ to die to pay the penalty for our sin. He rose again on the third day. He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father. He offers to, to fill that emptiness with himself, with the forgiveness that he provides through his death, burial, and resurrection. So that whoever would simply believe in him it's very simple. Just believe. Put your trust in Him, and you will be saved, Paul says. And that emptiness can be filled, but only through Jesus Christ, the one who is Himself peace and provides peace for those who put their faith in Him. And notice, 
Paul says that he provides peace regardless of the circumstance. Doesn't matter. May, may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. So whatever it is, we can experience the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he concludes verse six, uh, 16 with, the Lord be with you all, so that the knowledge of the presence of the Lord Jesus in our lives every moment of every day provides peace for us. I have a few notes I wrote in my Bible. I'm going to share them with you. I didn't put them on the, on the screen. But this idea of peace, and we won't go to the passages because we're simply out of time, but you can write them down, look at them later. You probably know most of them. Anyway, number one, peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a product of the Spirit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that has taken up residence in us. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It's a product, but it's also obtained or accessed, probably a better word, by refusing anxiety. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You've heard me quote that a number of times. To be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer, uh, um, of course, prayer and um, supplication. Thank you. That's a word we use every day, right? Prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. And what? The peace of God that surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So it's, it's accessed by refusing anxiety and taking our concerns to the Lord. It is a goal for the church family. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, uh, live in peace with one another. So it's a goal of the church family. It is a, a, a promise to be received. Again, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, but also in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, uh, Paul writes, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful. And then finally, it is a pursuit for each believer. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse 22, Paul writes to him and says, now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So peace is a product of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22. It's, it's accessed by refusing anxiety and taking those to the Lord. It's a goal uh, for the, our church family. It's a promise to be received, Colossians 3.15, and it is a pursuit of each individual believer. Well, Paul goes on then and authenticates his letter. Verse 17, I, Paul, write a greeting with my own hand. This is the a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is how I write. And then he closes once again with this all-encompassing benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Paul calls upon the grace of Lord Jesus Christ. He calls upon the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ himself because of this false teaching that had come into the church was threatening to destroy the church from within. They already had not won the battle, but they were uh, uh, um, successfully fighting the battle against those outside of the church trying to destroy it by simply continuing on in faith. Now they have to face the battle from within the church, from this the results of this false teaching concerning the day of the Lord. And Paul calls upon the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with them always. And that's what we need as a, as a church family. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't know if it's going to get really bad. Uh, I would assume it is because Paul said it would, and maybe it'll get bad here in Lubbock before the Lord Jesus calls us home. We need each other. None of us have all the answers, and we need each other. None of us is strong enough. It's the old saying, no man is an island, right? I don't know who said it, but it's truth. It is doubly true for the church. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. We need each other. And in order for us to, to be able to maintain that bond in the midst of struggles and trials, we have to have the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we have to be living in a manner that reflects the teaching of Scripture so that we can maintain that bond of unity. And one of the things we have to guard against is false doctrine creeping in that will eventually cause the church to fall apart. And so our, my encouragement to you all is to always, and this is like a broken record, I understand, but I'm going to keep skipping to this point. Be in the Word for yourself. Study the Word so that you can show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the Word of truth. And then be doers of the Word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. And in that way, we can maintain the fellowship, the love, the familial bonds that we have here at Cornerstone Bible Church. And at the same time, when people see our love for one another, Jesus says that will attract those outside of the church. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that we've handled it correctly today. And Lord, if there's anyone online or here this morning who's never put their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that they would do that right now since this moment is all they have promised. And Father, as your children, as your servants, I pray for each of us that we would live in a manner that reflects who we are in Christ. That our lives would be salt and light in this dark and ever increasingly dark world. Lord Jesus, I look forward to the day you call us home. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. In your name we pray, amen.